G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Draw with Jazza. I'm Jazza and in today's video we're going to be going through five top tips that you can apply to your workflow that are really awesome for digital drawing and design and I'm specifically going to be approaching these tips through the angle of character design which is my personal favorite thing to refine my workflow of and improve my skills in. And speaking of improving skills, this video is sponsored by Skillshare and I'm familiar with Skillshare because a couple of years ago I actually subscribed to them because of a course uh, put up by Patrick Brown, who is one of my all-time top favorite artists. And actually more recently, he came out with a course called Characters in a Scene from Sketch to Digital. Now I say this because Skillshare approached me and asked me if I'd be interested in making a video talking about that platform. And of course, because I had used it before and I knew it was good value, I thought it would be really interesting to put together a bit of a compilation video of some top tips that I've learned as I've scoured and watched loads of courses on Skillshare. So as you can see, I've already passed over watching 100 minutes of Skillshare videos today, but I've actually been enjoying these classes and courses in the background while I've been working on other projects over the last few weeks. So aside from sharing you these tricks in this video, I will also link to the courses and refer to them specifically in the video. Make sure to go to Skillshare.com where you can start browsing for free and check out what is available. They have over 10,000 classes in illustration, drawing, design, and more, and you can get a discount with the first three months only cost 99 cents for three unlimited months of premium Skillshare. And then from there, a subscription to Skillshare can be as low as $8 a month and it's a really great middle ground between expensive formal education and free YouTube videos but can at times be difficult to target and find the exact tip, tool, technique or teacher that you need to uh, complete the project or task you want to get done. So today I'm actually going to be drawing in Photoshop and I'm going to be demonstrating the five tips uh, and techniques and tricks that I found most useful and that I will be applying to my workflow moving forwards each of which are tips and tricks that I never even knew about before watching the Skillshare Tutor videos. The first thing I want to talk about was from a course by Charlie Bowwater where she demonstrated using silhouettes of characters in the sketching brainstorming process to develop a character's concept. So I signed myself a design brief to create a medieval blacksmith character. I tend to love medieval uh, character designs and so I thought it'd be fun to do something like that. And I played around with a few basic silhouettes. Now those of you who have watched my videos will know that I've done this before but with weapons and I have never actually really uh, realized to do this with characters as far as character design. But after watching Charlie's videos, I wanted to approach this silhouette process by uh, using interesting shapes to create bold looking character designs with those strong poses. Now in the end, this is one I was happy with. It has that really broad sort of character pose with a good strong silhouette. So in throwing this off on the side, I actually duplicated uh, this pose a couple of times and threw over a few different varying details. Because I had a basic silhouette I wanted to work with, I again very roughly started just scratching around with different uh, clothing and facial features, weaponry, little tweaks to the pose and proportions. And overall, the middle one here is the one I was happiest with and decided to move forward with. This process of thumbnail sketching is really simple and really rough and loose. And that's the thing I like about it because I like drawing with construction lines. Normally, if I'm drawing a character pose, I'll use a construction pencil and uh, slowly build the geometry of a character, add things like the uh, torso, the rib cage, things like that. And while I still like this method for building poses in particular, I found that working with thumbnail sketches allows you to really quickly and easily build poses without worrying about accuracy of geometry and proportions and really focus on the strength of silhouette. And it also allows you to be a little bit more ambitious where you might not otherwise. And if you make mistakes, that's okay too because you've invested far less time in producing the concept. So once again, that's our first tip from Charlie Bowell class something I really enjoyed and from there she goes into more detail and then slowly but surely adds more and more refinement to her painting and that's what I'm going to be doing next. I actually copied and pasted my thumbnail into a different Photoshop image file and this next little thing isn't one of my top five tips technically but it is something I gathered that someone did in one of their courses that I thought was really cool where they pull the window out uh, of a smaller file or a thumbnail file and you can see I have this Photoshop window. The cool thing about this is I can actually put it here in the corner or resize it and I have that permanently there as a reference and I can move around in my image with the larger resolution that I'm working in here and my reference is there the whole time. So again this isn't one of my top five tips but 
super cool and I'd never known to do that before because normally I would just paste the references in the canvas that I'm working with but of course that means if I'm zooming in or out I can lose the position or visual cues of that reference. So I'm going to move forward into some black and white painting just like Charlie did but I'm actually going to shift over to uh, approach it in a way that Gabrielle did in her series paint a portrait in Photoshop blank canvas to finished illustration she goes through the value painting process essentially referring to black and white painting. I really enjoyed the way Gabrielle talked about value painting in particular, what the blacks and whites mean, and that we rarely do use solid whites uh, and solid blacks, and there are different methods when it comes to edges and surface shading, so on and so forth. So I have gotten a bit of a head start here because I've done a bit of a sketch, as you can see, using my silhouette as a base, and then I've added a new silhouette underneath, just a flat color, sort of a mid-tone gray for my value painting, and I've started off by zooming out sort of about the same size as my thumbnail reference and bringing in some shadow. So as you can see it's only one tone darker in the shading it's in that gray tone and I'm doing black and white painting here I'll be working in these gray areas and I won't be working in full extremes in all areas of the piece I'll be varying it throughout. So where the first tip slash trick that I talked about was that thumbnail sketching and refinement process the next tip slash trick I want to talk about when it comes to digital painting and design is is painting with values and varying your observation. What I mean by painting with values is what I explained, painting in those grey tones essentially to create form and starting off really rough like I have here and then you'll see me slowly adding more detail to both the lights and darks. But when I say varying observation, as you can see I'm zoomed out fully here and this really simplifies my view and lets me be quite loose and relaxed without over investing in details and then zooming in of course when I get to details but always jumping back out to get that distant view which is something Gabrielle talks about in her videos. And the other thing that I noticed a lot of instructors do in their courses is that they flip the canvas quite regularly to notice mistakes that they make or uh, let their eye pick up areas that they weren't naturally picking up or were sort of phasing out. Quite literally, I noticed that uh, about 90% of the instructors were doing this and this is something I've never really done. And obviously a lot of people have gained benefit from that. So I wanna try and do that myself as I go through this process. So value painting while varying my observation. Again, this being an incremental process, I approach it bit by bit and only gradually change the tone, starting off with mid to dark tones and then eventually moving on to lighter tones. One of the things I observed from most of my favorite uh, tutors and lessons is that the uh, most effective ways of painting have a really asymmetrical balance of light and shadow. And I do find that I tend to be naturally a little bit safe and paint my values a little bit evenly throughout. So in this piece, I attempted to replicate a little bit of that asymmetry Symmetry, particularly by darkening the back leg and the lower part of the torso and midriff and having a few really bright areas at the top of the belly to really bring that out, the shoulders, the forehead and the upper arms of the character. The lightest part of the character is a rim lighting edge that I add to the topmost edge of the character to signify a light source behind the character and also add a little bit of depth and solidity. And then going in and adding some crisp edges and sharper details in the face in particular, most notably in the eyes, nose and mouth. So I've got my character design in a place I'm happy with. And as you can see, it's come quite a long way from the thumbnail. I don't need this reference anymore so I can close this window. But starting from real simplicity and then slowly building upon that, this is the result that I have. So the third top tip I wanna share with digital drawing and design in Photoshop is something that I didn't know existed and is super, super cool. This was a trick I found in a series by Josh Berkeley, who uh, basically had a, a bunch of videos where he talks about texture, making your own texture overlays. But this little tool is a hidden nugget that he demonstrated that I didn't know existed. If you go Windows, extensions and then open Adobe color themes, you then met with this little window, which looks a little incomprehensible to begin with, but basically it helps you find color combinations that work really well together and in different ways that can sort of help simplify the process uh, as far as you finding a color scheme for characters, objects, design pieces, whatever. So first things first, I'm gonna create a duplicate of my black and white character here, and I'm gonna create a clipping mask on top of this layer and paint with my paintbrush just to fill in all of his skin areas. 
Uh, the clipping mask is done by alt clicking the layer on top of the core layer I don't want to go outside the edges of. Now I'm going to fiddle around with the color overlays until I find one that works well with skin tones. There we go, this is quite nice, this vivid light color. So now in this layer I'm simply going to paint in my skin tone. Now I'm happy with the skin tone so while I have it selected I'm going to open my color swatches library which is currently empty in my creative cloud library and I'm just going to add my foreground color, hit add. And so I have my skin tone there. In fact, I can name this skin base, hit enter. And so now I can find and select the skin tone anytime I want. Now back to this Adobe color themes window. The reason I bought this up and the reason I think it's really useful and can absolutely imagine using this quite often in the future, this little wheel here, as you can see, if I move one of these selectors around, changes the uh, additional colors on either side of that central color to complement or contrast uh, in it with a different mode. So this is monochromatic mode. So you'll notice if I change it to, let's say, uh, orange or yellow, these other colors will create a color scheme in a monochromatic way that I can use. More interestingly, if I go to triad, you'll see that things all of a sudden look a little bit different. If I select, say, a blue, I am met with orange and green, but each in a way that is sort of calculated to match or complement it. Now, you may or may not love the results that you get with this, but that's okay because they're customizable. You can change the color mode or the selection mode by clicking on these little buttons here on the bottom left. I personally prefer the HSB color selection. So by selecting your central primary color here, I can find a uh, rich brown saturated color that I wanna work with like that. And already in this compound mode, I'm given a few other options that I can use. And I can keep that central brownish color and see what other schemes I'm met with in triad or in shades, so on and so forth. I like my compound mix though. So I'm going to tweak this by with compound selected, going to custom, and then I can select each of these colors and tweak them to my liking so that I have a selection in the end of something that I'm really happy with. I'm going to add a little bit of a silvery color in here because these are different colors I plan on using for different areas of my character here. Not for the entirety of the character, but for broader areas of the character. So let's say I'm happy with the selection of colors. I'll name this color theme Blacksmith. And I've saved that into my Color Swatches Creative Cloud Library. And there it is right under Color Themes. And the cool thing about this is I have a palette that I can select colors quickly and easily from and paint them without needing to manually change them in the color picker or paint them on the canvas in a way that I can alt click and select them from. Not only that, they're also protected from accidental deletion or manipulation because they're saved here in my Creative Cloud Libraries. And I can bring them up here in my Adobe Color Theme tool anytime I want to make any tweaks. So I'm going to anchor my Adobe color themes on the right here because I can picture using this quite a bit in the future. Just by clicking that button, it brings up the color themes panel and then I can hide it by clicking that so it's nice and out of the way. And then creating a new layer inside the clipping mask of my character here, I'm going to select each of these colors and assign them to areas that I think they'll look good in. So with the layer that I'm working on set to the blend mode overlay, I just paint on the basic colors into the sections that I think that these colors will work best in. Now for the sake of simplicity, I'll mostly stick to these colors, except I just add a generic dark desaturated brown for the pants. But in other scenarios, I might add some tonal variation throughout the piece after I'd laid down the core colors. Once I'm happy with how it's applied, I play around with the blend modes and find that I prefer the colors applied in a multiply blend mode. I bring down the opacity to make it a little less saturated and I feel like this slightly darker more desaturated tone of the color schemes works really well with the character. So that's the result of me whacking some color in and it really helped take out a lot of the guesswork and make it a bit more fun uh, by using these color themes in the uh, Adobe interface. I'm loving how this guy is looking. I'm going to bring him down a little bit and I'm actually going to uh, paint uh, a little bit behind him just to make him stand out more. So to do this, I'm just going to select this gray of the background and select a lighter version of it. And this really helps bring him out and also adds some texture and interest to the piece. And then to do so even more on a layer on top of that, I'm gonna select a darker gray and bring my brush size down. And I'm actually going to very roughly sort of scribble in a bit of a shadow area behind him. This doesn't have to be perfect because this is just a character concept piece, but in a really fluffy, rough sort of way, I'm going to uh, replicate his silhouette back here. This is actually another neat little trick that I saw in one of the courses. I think this was from the course by Charlie with the uh, thumbnail sketches tip that I took. So I'm really happy with that, adds a lot of depth and let's uh, make it a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna paint a blue, flat blue, 
uh, on that layer above it and then just go through some overlays until I find one I'm happy with. So I have my character concept here. I'm really happy with him, but now I'm gonna implement another little tip and trick I learned through a bunch of different courses, in particular one by Patrick Brown, the one that I hadn't yet watched, where he goes through creating characters in the scene from sketch to digital, and also Sarita Kalatka's series on character design, Bring Your Imagination to Life. Both of these series outline some color tweaks in particular for the skin tones that I think are really effective and that I didn't know about. So I'm gonna apply those to this character here. So I'm gonna create a new layer and I'm going to select my skin tone and I'm gonna bring it down to a warmer red or pinkish tone, hit okay. And then with the overlay set to soft light, I'm gonna gently make the nose at the end a bit redder, same with the lips and the ears. This may actually be more effective with a lighter pink. Let's see what it looks like here. And again, paint into the nose, lips and ears. And this really does create a much more lifelike translucency with the skin. It adds a bit of warmth and depth, particularly in areas around the edges where the light is being caught. Now I'm using it sparingly in other areas of the skin tones where the light is catching, but in both of these artists' courses, they go over how in particular in the ears, uh, in the nose, in the lips, and in the fingers, and sometimes elbows, uh, using that pinker tone really does bring things out and make it more realistic and, and uh, a little warmer and more lifelike. I can hide and bring that back and it really does add quite a lot of life to this character design. That's a really nice little addition to the piece here and takes it to a new level. Again, without and with. That is so cool. Now also in relation to skin tone shading, I'm gonna demonstrate another little tip that I learned from Patrick Brown's course. I've made a duplicate layer of my character here all on one flat image. Now previously I just thought of the dodge and burn tool as things that you can use to make areas lighter or darker. But what I didn't know is that in the dodge tool and burn tool, you can select the range that you dodge and burn. In this top panel up here, by default it's selecting mid tones, but you can actually dodge or burn the shadows and highlights lights, each of which has a different effect. So I'm going to demonstrate these effects just by copying the head of this character. So I'm going to start off with the burn tool. The burn tool by default makes everything darker. So if I, on this character here, use the default burning the mid-tones. Up here in the range, I'm going to select highlights and on the far left character, I'm going to burn the highlights. And then now just burning the shadows, I'm gonna paint over here on the right. Now you'll notice the effect is quite a bit different, particularly on the right, that's a really harsh burn that we're creating. So now when I switch over to my dodge tool, again with mid-tones by default, dodging in some of the areas that are the highlights, but now selecting highlights and in my character on the left here, you'll notice that this dodge tool is really making those highlights pop and bringing out the warmth of the highlights very rapidly. And then last but not least, selecting shadows and applying it over here on the right. If anything, it's actually more desaturating the tones in the highlights of this character. So each of these three heads has had the dodge and burn tool uh, applied to them in equal measure. But with the character on the right, we've been dodging and burning with the shadows. In the middle, we've been using the mid-tones. And on the left, we've been using the highlights. And what I've gathered from doing this and in Patrick Brown's example is I like a combination of burning with the mid-tone or shadows and dodging with the highlights or mid-tones, depending on my needs and the vibrancy I want to create. So going back to my character here, burning in some of the shadows and then dodging in some of the highlights uh, with the highlight mode selected. Now as a result, you can see that the vibrancy of the character and the shading in particular has really jumped out and given uh, quite a lot of life and, and uh, some tonal variance throughout the piece. Now normally I would go through and create some tonal variance in the color application manually, but using the dodge and burn in this way does a little bit of that work for us. And you can see if I hide and bring that back in comparison comparison to our original, it's so much more tangible and full of life now that we've used the dodge and burn in a way that really brings out the warmth and the vibrancy in our piece. So number five and the last tip that I want to be sharing with you today is non-destructive editing and manipulation to add the final tweaks to your image. So I'm gonna select all the layers that have anything to do with my blacksmith character here, whether they're in the past and invisible or not. And I'm going to right click in the uh, layers area with all these selected and select convert to smart object. And now I have one object in my layers panel with this 
blacksmith character, but by double clicking the smart object, I can actually enter sort of its own mini inception style Photoshop file where I can bring back the layers as I please, perhaps even go to the black and white version of the character, save. And then when I go back to the original version of the Photoshop file, it's replaced it with the changes I've made. And at any time before I want to tweak my smart object, I simply double click on it and I can, let's say, bring back the final version that I'm happy with, save, and then go back to my Photoshop file and there he is. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the background here, select everything in the background, convert it to a smart object. Obviously I have all these layers for all the other stages of the illustration that I demonstrated, but because I don't need those, I'm just gonna select all of them and group them and I'll call this history. Hit enter and now very neatly, I have a non-destructive record of all of the parts of the painting, in particular these smart objects that I can go into make my tweaks and go back to my main Photoshop file. Another one of the non-destructive ways I can edit my piece is by using these adjustments. Now I have a panel here called adjustments, which I have anchored in my panel here on the right, which allows me to, let's say when I select brightness and contrast, change the brightness and contrast of the piece. But this is in a non-destructive way. You can see that this is applied on the right here in sort of a mask style area. So likewise, I can select hue saturation and I can bring down the saturation maybe tweak the hue to the left or the right. I'll maybe make it negative two to make it a touch warmer. And I can go back and tweak any of the changes I've made to any of these adjustments by clicking on them and you'll see it pops up here. Let's bring up that contrast a bit. But again, this is non-destructive, so I can hide and bring back these changes as I wish. And let's say I prefer the saturation, so I'll bring that back, maybe even ramp it up a little bit. But perhaps I like the character more desaturated and the background more saturated. I can actually just go in here and select my background layer and in image adjustments and hue saturation, I can bring up the saturation of the background only and hit okay. And you'll notice that this has been applied to that layer non-destructively because it's a smart object. So you can see it here under that smart object, hue saturation, I can double click on this and change that saturation value, hit okay. And it maintains the, uh, the raw uh, smart object data inside this clip. Again, if I double click and go inside it, it's the original state that I saved it in. But if I go back in here, all of those non-destructive changes have been applied. And the cool thing is I can also do things like filter blur and apply a Gaussian blur to the whole background. And that's non-destructive also, because once again, double clicking the smart object, all of the information is there. But in this application, the blur and the contrast and the hue saturation is applied. I'll maybe bring the brightness down a bit too to uh, make the character stand out a bit more. Hit OK, I'm happy with that. This method is once again, something demonstrated by Joash Berkeley. I don't know how to pronounce it in his course, Efficient Texture Workflows. But the finished result is I have this character concept here that I'm really happy with. He pops out, has a bit of life and color in him. And I was able to speed up and optimize my workflow. And of course, make it more fun and a bit more of an exploration and adventure by applying those tips and techniques that I learned from those courses that I shared with you. I really hope that you enjoyed the tips and techniques that I shared with you in this video. Once again, using the coupon code Jazza Draws, you can get a huge discount and get three months on Skillshare for only 99 cents. And the amount of information and professional quality resources for graphic design and illustration alone are staggering, but there's loads more. One of my favorite sections of the, uh, the website is actually in business and marketing and entrepreneurship. They're actually topics I find really interesting and like to listen to in the background while I paint and do things like that. And you can see there are loads of topics here from film to technology, fashion, music, gaming, food, and more. Not only is it a great place to learn all of these skills, but it being Skillshare, of course, is a place that you can share your expertise. So you can actually sign up today to become a teacher on Skillshare and share your skills, tips, and techniques and get paid for the courses and subscribers that you gain through Skillshare. Look at this, top teachers make up to $40,000 a year. So there's definitely potential for great growth here, surrounded by really good quality stuff and people really interested in learning. So I highly recommend it. And there's no time like the present to give it a go with that coupon code. Again, $3 for that three months and you get a really in-depth look at all of their stuff with a premium membership and uh, see what you think. Thank you so much for watching, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, the links to all of the videos I referenced are in the description and the working file for this Photoshop document is also for free for you to enjoy and explore. The link to that is also in the description. Thank you for watching and until next time, ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you later. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to my channel for new content every week.
If you want to support my work and get some goodies for yourself, head over to my store for archives, ebooks, digital brushes, video courses, and more. If you enjoyed this video, here's a link to another video you might like from this channel. And if you want even more, make sure to check out all my behind the scenes action on my vlog channel, Daily Jazza. Draw with Jazza is proudly sponsored by Adobe. Join the creative cloud today and get loads of incredible creative tools like Photoshop, Animate, Premiere Pro, and other apps for your computer or mobile device. That's it for now. Thanks for joining the arty party and until next time, I'll see you later.